I'm Frederick Gerton, and I'm the filmmaker. And I'm Leilani Farha, and I'm the advocate. And this is Pushback Talks now on Clubhouse. We want to see if we, there's a way we can connect with listeners and, and friends and to bring more people on. So you've spent all this morning talking to Taipei, I understand. You've been in a conference in Taiwan. Yeah, not quite a conference, but it was a meeting early morning for me here in Ottawa, Canada, uh, with the city of Taipei and my dear colleague and the deputy director of the shift, Julieta Peruca, was there as well. We were talking, well, they were mainly talking about their social housing program, which sounded pretty interesting, I have to say. They're building architecturally designed social housing with art installations and um, into really integrated into the city to try to break down stereotypes about how poor people live. So it's pretty cool. Cool. I, I actually spend a day or a day and a night in Taipei on my way between uh, our showings in Kuala Lumpur and in, uh, in San Francisco. So oh, I walked yeah. around and I've been there once before. It's, it's, it's a very interesting town, but it's very expensive, isn't it, to live? Yes, we didn't get into that too much, but they were saying that it is expensive. They said they haven't seen a rapid increase in rents or cost of housing. They have a very high ownership rate, home ownership rate, 85%. I think it's one of the highest in the OECD countries. Uh, so it's interesting, but they also have a homelessness problem, which they, they, we didn't get into too, I don't know if they wanted to talk to me about that on this first call, you know, maybe on the second call. Okay, but we should do, we should do a podcast on, on Taiwan. I'm, I'm really interested. I actually invited them to push back talks, but uh, we'll have to deal with some translation issues. We'll see. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm just before coming in, I was talking to, to friends in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and they have uh, just bought 10 screenings of push and they want to have a like an impact workshop film impact workshop with with push and i will be uh, like a lecturer in that so that we'll do that on monday it will also be very early for me they asked if i could do 5 a.m and i said Ouch. maybe not 5 a.m in <laughs> monday morning so i, uh, I okay I, I will do an 8 a.m monday morning right so i have to reduce my my wine drinking to it to maybe only one or one and a half bottle Tragic. Tragic. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> awful. It's awful. Sorry, friends out there, um, as this is a, is, a, is a clubhouse, you can also wave and say, I have a very interesting question, or I, I, I know what you should talk about in Pushback Talks, because now we've been doing over 30 episodes, and we kind of keep producing week by week, and we are like a little bit struggling to to get time to do everything. So what are we going to do next week, for example? We haven't decided on Leilani. We have not. We, I know we have a very good guy in Berlin that we should bring in quite soon. Mm. Yes, and I'm, I'm going to talk to someone in Beirut, Lebanon, next week, but not but just to see if there might be something we could do there. And I have some folks in Puerto Rico whom I was thinking might be interesting to have That's on Pushback cool. Talks. I could so. actually see mm -hmm. that on our Vimeo player where you can watch Push, that, that we had two viewings in Puerto Rico this night. Yes, I'm doing a, doing a conference there uh, sometime soon, and so I encouraged them to watch Push. And in fact, I think they're going to screen Push for that conference. It's cool, cool. I mean, mm -hmm. we, the, the, this podcast has now audience in 106 countries. 106? 106. I mean, it should be mm. more because there are more countries. So I'm a little bit <laughs> stressed, but and it's fine. It's fine. But now I, I look around and I see people hanging out here in our clubhouse. And I see, for example, Miss Julieta. Hi. Julieta, you're, you're like famous from the film Push because you suddenly got hired as, as an assistant to Leilani as when she was a special rapporteur. 
and now you are like the deputy director of uh, of the shift. That's like that's a career, isn't it? It's a full career. Just it happened within <laughs> within a couple of years. I can't believe it. That's really cool. So what do you think? What do you think about our podcast? What do you what what uh, are we delivering, or are we a bit boring? Look, I was just talking with my best friend. Out of out of the blue, she texted me five minutes ago and said last week's podcast was incredible, and the week before was also incredible, and it's now her favorite podcast. Oh. And, and she even wrote hashtag obsessed. So. T- tell her that we have a little bit of a lack of love letters, so it's uh, yeah. We need more love. Some we need perfume more love. and uh, and and hearts. <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice. Kill deliver. Yeah. <laughs> but you're you're based in Geneva in Switzerland. I am based in Geneva. Yeah. But I have to say, I moved here right before the pandemic, so I could be anywhere in the world. I'm mostly based in my apartment. Yeah. And you spend a lot of time zooming around the world. So, what? Tell me, t- tell me about your working day. What are you? What are you doing? What is your? What is your role in the shift? I'm the deputy director of the shift. I have been spending a lot of my time working in Canada with local governments in Canada, and supporting them and actually operationalizing the right to housing on the ground. So it's a lot of Zooms in West Coast time and East Coast time, <laughs> not Geneva time. It's, uh, it's interesting. It's interesting work. And I mean, we're, we have quite the privilege to be able to work with so many government officials that are actually serious about implementing the right to housing, doing something about financialization, trying to figure out how to deal with and eliminate homelessness. It can be both... Uh, inspiring and challenging let's say that <laughs> it is of course challenging but because when you f- when i follow the the updates from the the housing crisis around the world in this, also from canada it's it's a lot of harsh stories coming out people being evicted in the midst of a pandemic i mean that's the big story in many countries right now and i guess that's what you are a little bit engaged in you know this kind of to defend people's right to stay in their homes. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think also a big part of our work at the moment is trying to make governments understand that human rights are actually a framework by which they can govern. It's something that's helpful to them. It's not just a stick to tell them that they're doing something wrong. Yeah, there's so much energy right now we're finding for the right to housing. It's really amazing. And and I think the pandemic is part of that because it's exposed obviously how important housing is and a safe place to live and etc but uh we're excited at the shift because every week every day practically we get something new coming in a new like taipei i mean who knew taipei wanted to pursue the right to housing and what we're finding too is cities are interested in the shift because they want to connect with each other so using the shift as a way to meeting other city governments so it's pretty interesting but julieta you didn't tell the truth about how you're spending the bulk of your time what are you really doing raising money <laughs> <laughs> so that the money is rolling in i'm sure oh yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> not yet but it will not yet but it will that's cool i can also see here that we have sam in london and sam i got to know working for 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 you leilani when you were a special rapporteur also as your researcher, and he helped a lot to do this Blackstone dive, the deep research on on this big hedge fund. Sam, are you there? Hi. Yes, I am. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. How uh, how is life in at the London Shift office? <laughs> um, yeah, my back room in my small flat. Um, <laughs> uh, it's it's good. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. We're having a, a nice cold day in London. It's been snowing here. Oh, snowing. No, no. What's all that about? It was snowing and then it was really hot. Yeah, hor- horrible. Yeah, we have the same kind of backlash. We, that's kind of we share in all Europe, like this this weather backlash. It's not, I mean, it's enough with a COVID backlash. Now we also got the weather backlash. Yeah, exactly. It's, Weather's fed up as well. Yeah, poor us. So, Sam, you, I mean, I guess you listened to the podcast we have out this week with, with Sarah Chase. Yes. 
shit. Did you did you hear what she said about Blackstone? That Blackstone is a full fledged member of the kleptocratic network. Yes, yeah. yes. Not just a facilitator, a full fledged member. And you know, Sarah Chase, we didn't talk about that in the podcast because it got so intense, but she is not only a journalist, she worked as an, as an advisor to the, head, the chief of staff, you know, the presidential yeah. advisor, the, the prime military advisor to the president. That's right. And she was working, and that's what it was for Obama, and working with exactly the, the corruption issues because she means that the corruption is actually leading to pushing people into the arms of the extremes. I mean, the, the Talibans and the Boko Harams and so around the world. So the corrupt state is like almost helping. So she, she meant if the Americans want to change the world, they also need to fight corruption. Of course, that program got totally killed off under, under Trump because he is, of course, also a part of the corrupt network. Anyway, I thought just for you, I, thought, I was thinking of you, your, your Blackstone research. So what are you doing these days, uh, Sam? Uh, I'm doing so many different things. Maybe not as exciting as uh, trying to take down Blackstone, but... Um... <laughs> we're, not, we're, we're not taking down Blackstone. We are, we're tickling them a little bit under the little toe, you know. Get them to take down <laughs> their own human rights infringing behaviours. Um, I am, I just, I'm working on lots of different research projects, really. I'm doing a, a project at the moment about human rights zoning. Doesn't that sound exciting? Mm -hmm. Tell me, tell me. <laughs> no, we're doing a project set up, just doing some research on um, how city zoning decisions can impact on, on the human right to housing and including within that kind of discrimination um, and how different communities experience the human right to housing differently based on zoning decisions. I think it's interesting from the, po I, I'm not a big zoning person. I don't know anything about zoning, hence Sam doing the research. But what, what is zoning? zoning? Zoning from our perspective sounds very North American, but is, it, is that something you talk about also in, in, in the UK? Uh, not as much particularly, but no, I think it's more of a North American phenomenon. Can you explain it? What is it? The idea of cities deciding how land can be used, so what's buildings can be built on a particular piece of land, how many buildings can be built on a particular piece of land, how what distance between different types or the same type of building. So it's like the requirements in city planning. You decide that in this area you're allowed to build 20 stories and in the other there's only two stories, that kind of... Exactly, yeah. But then in North America you also, much more than in Europe, you also decide that in this street there is only private homes, and in this street, there can also be shops. So that's why you in in North, I mean, in Canada and in the U.S., you have all these long, long streets with with shops, and then the other streets with no shops, which is like for us very strange when we, mm. from a European perspective. So that's that's the zoning. Well, and it's so it, to try to change zoning to facilitate, let's say, good housing or a certain kind of housing, social housing or um, uh, a mixed, you know, commercial residential is all is um, almost impossible in North America. I mean, that's what people say. Um, and there's crazy zoning that goes on, like even in my own neighborhood it, on my street. I live in a very uh, between two blocks, like really small there's just a few houses and our homes cannot be divided into multi multi units but if i walk one minute to the left or one minute to the right i could own property where i could have multi zoning so it's it, multi units so it's 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 a total mess the whole zoning issue so i think it's good actually to research it even if it seems a bit dry <laughs> you know what? It's I was exp I went into this being like I have no idea about zoning. I'm like you, Leilani. Like I'm, my whole background is legal, so like I don't yeah. have any like practical knowledge. Or, but but I'm really I'm finding really interesting. It's really interesting how these decisions are made on the ground and how those come to to influence people's enjoyment of their rights. Like how such a small decision or even the influence of a certain community like within NIMBYism can have a huge impact on uh, people's human rights within a city. Mm. Interesting, interesting. You, so you're all legals? You, Leilani, Sam, Julieta, 
Or, I mean, or do you have any normal people working with you? Or is <laughs> we do. In fact, we you do. do. We you do. do. Okay. We have we have two new, really normal people, and I think oh, that they me, are in the room. Oh, let me let me listen to the new normal people. Yeah. We like, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> Kix is here, our comms person. Kix, do you want to say hi? Yeah. Hi. I'm I'm a normie. I'm a normal person. <laughs> <laughs> Can, tell me, what uh, what level of n normal are you? It's it's always good to know you. How do I measure that? Um, I don't know. I, I didn't go to I didn't go to law school, so I guess that that level. That's that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I did. I went to grad school, but not not law school. So. So what? What did tell me about your? What do you do for the shift? Yeah. Uh, well, I, all things communication. So that's uh, social media, press releases, um, writing letters, anything outward facing usually crosses my eyes before it goes out to the world. So I spend all day trying to figure out how to say things in a in a shorter or more interesting or more fun way, which is not always uh, easy with what we're talking about. Well, when you work with, with legal people, of course, yeah, then it's like you have to tr <laughs> translate everything. That's right. Make yeah. it lighter, more interesting. Yeah, of course, of <clears throat> course. Indeed. But uh, Kirsten, you, so you are... I mean, Leilani is in Ottawa, Julieta is in Switzerland, Geneva, <laughs> and Sam is in London. I'm in Malmo, so where are you? I'm in Toronto. Toronto, okay. But you're American. I am American, yeah. I'm, I grew up up and down the East Coast, so like New York, Florida. Do you, do you regard that as some kind of exile, or how do you see it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, chosen exile for sure. And then most of my friends and family are like, is there a way for me to get up there with you? <laughs> Can we get married and then I'll come up there with you? <laughs> so I don't know, maybe more like a vacation. So you're going to marry your siblings now. That's complicated. I don't know. <laughs> you talk to your legal people here. Maybe it's... <laughs> it's sorry. Uh, did, did people warn you about my bad... By bad sense of humor? Yeah, I don't think we did. I'm really sorry. I'm really <laughs> sorry, everyone. Frederick's got a very particular sense of humor, shall we say. Mm. Uh -huh. But there's also somewhere called Keith here. Is that also somebody you placed in Keith is one of the normals. <laughs> yes, I'm the other normal guy. Where, where are you based, Keith? Also Toronto. Also Toronto. And what are you doing? Yes, so I'm an administrative officer with the SHIFT. So um, I'm basically, you know, checking a lot of emails for Leilani. Uh, just today, for example, she wasn't receiving some of the emails. So that's the kind of like, um, you know, work that I have to do. Just make sure everything's, you know, all the gears are going right. Poor Keith. You know what Keith really does, Frederick? He spends a lot of time working on my schedule. All of the invites go to Keith, and Keith has to somehow make it make sense and make sure I'm at the right place at the right time. But you, uh, Keith, you're Nicaraguense, no? Yes, uh -huh. and I've been to Sweden a couple of times, actually. Ah, cool. Yeah, cool. in uh, Stockholm, uh, I have an aunt that lives in Lidingo, ah, very yeah. posh, and uh, I also have a cousin that lives in Sudermalm, so I was just thinking about like the real estate. It's so expensive there. Mm, Stockholm is not it's, it's not affordable for us, but we have listeners in Stockholm, so I will not sp speak badly about the city. There's a lot of nice people up there, um, but it's 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 very expensive. So, but it, but nice to have you in the team. I, we know that Leilani certainly needs help, so it's I'm happy that you are doing it. I'm glad to be uh, here, yeah. <laughs> so it's cool. No, I mean the. the the fun thing was this this uh, alien from the Danish uh, Human Rights Institute. She had, she actually found out about us through the Oatly debate. You know, the, this oat milk company here from Malmo that suddenly got a in big investment from from uh, Blackstone. And of course, I wrote an art article about, it, I tweeted about, it, and it became like a big story. And we made a podcast about it that she had heard. And then after the podcast, she actually started to, to watch the film. Ah, interesting. So it's, Good. A, it's, yeah, and then she found out about, you know, so Oatly, podcast, film. And now she wants to show the film. It's, it's kind of nice. And actually today, or like a few days ago, 
uh, Financial Times had a big story on Oatly. Oh. And, uh, and I was quoted. Of course, they talked to me like half an hour, and it was like maybe one or two sentences. So I re kind of represented the criticism like in a very, very vague way. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's how yeah. it rolls. Uh, so uh, Oatly is doing fine. If anybody is worried about Oatly, they are doing fine. Uh, they are now going public in the U.S. and they're inviting a lot of money into the business. So that everybody will be happy and rich, yeah. except the rest of us. I know, because of us having done the Oatly episode, actually, we in some ways broke that story, Frederick, you know, I think we were all over that before many others. But as a result of that, you know, because of the way telephones work, um, cell phones work, now I get all of these email, um, no, news updates about how oat milk is doing and how Oatly is doing in particular. So the latest is that it's doing very well with Starbucks. It mm. has a new partnership with Starbucks USA. Also and in China, Starbucks China also. And yeah. Starbucks China, there you go. And mm -hmm. one of the most popular drinks right now it, at Starbucks apparently is some oat milk thing. So there you mm. go, they're doing very well. Yeah. Despite our so, protests. So you can do good business and still breaking human rights. What do you think about that, friends? Mm. Uh, do we like it? <laughs> now you should all open up and say no. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Use your mic. People use, you know, they clap using their mics. Yeah. You have to get the clubhouse so, rules. Yeah. So uh, Julieta and Sam, what sh who should we bring on to to push back talks do you have any great ideas what 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 do we lack any any regions any cities any aspects of your work that you think we should talk about well i mean i don't know if you guys would be interested in doing anything like this but we are going to be pushing forward a project on the intersection between climate change and the right to housing and i think financialization has a really really interesting role to play in how cities keep propagating climate change and keep not controlling financialization and keep not realizing the right to housing. It's kind of all, you know, I don't know. We need kind of a fuller picture. Mm, but tell me, where is, the, where is that intersection? Well, with financialization, I mean, one of the things that we talk about uh, around climate change is that cities can't afford to continue building housing so that it can be used as speculative instruments if they are actually going to meet their carbon emission targets, knowing that the construction industry accounts for 40% of total global emissions. So if we are going to be building housing, we need to make sure that those, of course, that it's low carbon housing, but we also need to make sure that that housing is being used to meet the demand of the people. It's not just being used as an investment and destroying our, our planet. So you, what you're saying that the rich, that buy condos and then let them stay in these dark towers. They're actually also, be, there are some kind of climate uh, criminals on top of all the other crimes, kind of. <laughs> that wasn't a joke. <laughs> say it, Julia. It say wasn't it. a joke. <laughs> climate cr criminals. I mean, I think in a way, of course, you have, but I think it's governments who are also allowing these buildings to be built for absolutely no purpose and who are allowing these buildings to be built to contribute to their carbon emissions that can also be considered criminal. That's, I, mean, it's, I, I think this is really interesting, but how, uh, how, do you have any idea who is talking about this and who is, because I saw that, that, um, the big Bill Gates, Microsoft, he's like in his new book talks about the cement industry as also one of the the climate criminals. Yeah. Uh, so of course there is a lot of cement going into the to the to the dark towers, and and to and to our listeners, dark towers are buildings shooting up around the world with luxury condos, and quite often they stand dark in the night. So you know nobody is living there. So they, they just, it's just a parking place for money. And this is not only London, New York. It's, it's like all over big cities in Canada. It's, it's like in Southeast Asia a lot. You know, so it's, 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 it's a way people invest their money. 
Mm. But of course, to, to to if you can then add the climate perspective onto that debate, I think that's really, really interesting. I, I would like to do that. You have to help us to find somebody who can give us, um, let's say, um, a more global perspective on that mm. would be really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'll try to look for some. It's complicated, yeah. Only to say that, I mean, one, this is a totally new area. And so in some ways, Julieta's research is groundbreaking. And so maybe it's Julieta we end up ne needing to have on the show again. Um, but uh, also to say I have my own um, concerns about how we address this area of climate change and housing and still make sure that people who need housing can access it because there's an easy way in which if we go, <clears throat> you know, um, full, <clears throat> excuse me, full force for climate, you know, climate friendly buildings, what builders tell us is it's very expensive. And so then that means it's harder for them, they claim, to make affordable housing. And at the same time, if we, we so we don't want that, right? We don't want builders to say to use climate change to keep poor people out right um so we we have to be very um nuanced in our approach and then at the same time remember frederick when we were talking to franz timmermans the executive vice president of the european commission and he was talking about um the renovation wave that he wants to start he's responsible for europe's uh, green deal uh, and he was saying, you know, he wants this renovation wave, which, of course, we would all agree that that apartments are expensive often because they're not uh, energy efficient, for example, and people can't afford to turn on the heat as a result. And that makes their housing inadequate. But of course, my fear and many other people are fearful that the renovation wave will end up displacing tenants and tenants and, and will result in increase in rents to pay for the renovations. So it's, there's a way in which it's so important that we talk about climate change and the right to housing, but it's important that we remember there is a human right to housing in this, and it somehow has to inform. Yeah. I think we've been saying that a bit when we've been out with the film. We we need sustainable cities, yeah. but the cities also need to be socially sustainable. And and uh, so, I mean, this is kind of the, the crossing point of those two perspectives, and I think that's... That's something I really would like to talk more about. Mm -hmm. And I guess then Sam wants us to do a zoning episode. Yes, please. I want to do really detailed zoning episodes about every kind of specification in zoning, please. That's all I want. You know what will happen? We'll do it and it will be the most downloaded episode, honestly. Yeah. All the zoning people getting on board. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay, so... All you want to know about zoning, is that like the title of that episode? <laughs> yeah, that has to be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> everything, you, everything you didn't want to know about zoning. <laughs> everything you've dreamed about zoning. Frederick, one area I would like to cover at some point is, we've touched on it already, but where is the Biden administration going with housing? And are they charting new territory, new ground and how influential will that be, not just for the U.S., but globally? Because he's, you know, President Biden said housing is a right, not a privilege. He's pouring money into different aspects of housing. Um, it's pretty interesting. Let's do it. And, and you, I mean, I know you've been writing to AOC. Yeah. She's obviously not the best responder of emails. Not but yet. Not yet, but I mean, <laughs> we we should totally we we should certainly do uh, a U.S. story again. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, th because it is very interesting what happens now with with um, with Biden as a president, but also because of that, governments around the world are always checking out what the Americans are doing. So it's important if they That's do right. something good. Uh, and take a lead so. because, and of course, they also need to do it because we have mentioned it so many times: forty million Americans, one rent away from from eviction. So it's like it, it's they actually have a, a crisis hanging over them. You know, it's like it's. I mean, there's al already so many people, and when you see the homeless images from the big American cities, it's like it's it's in, it's insane. 
it's 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 very yeah. sad and that's now it's now that's right and we know yeah. that many of our listeners are people who work with homeless uh, issues and that's we're at, and we must just say that you're all really cool people and we admire your work because it's not uh, regarded as the most fancy job to do but it's like a society without solidarity with the homeless would be a very sad society so you're all great people so mm. but but we do we uh, you are now talking to taipei i would kuala lumpur i would like to have a little bit more understanding what happens in southeast asia because all these yes. big cities uh, there's a lot of evictions going on out of you know just by building condos and other stuff you know it's it's a it's such an easy way to because poor people always cheap to get rid of in some way mm. yes no we should absolutely do that uh i mean you know we haven't done an episode on india or engaging anyone in india that's obviously has such an incredible mix of things going on from financialization to um you know huge rates of homelessness uh, and evictions, um, and at the same time, some kind of interesting housing projects happening. So uh, I think India um, would be a hot spot to, to, to cover. But I also want to do Hong Kong. I think they're really suffering. Uh, their housing market continues to escalate in terms of cost. And as we know, young people were protesting before COVID and even into COVID. And part of what they were protesting was just how damn expensive it is in that city to live. And they're living in terrible conditions teeny little places you know many people in small places and 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 really mm. not having much of a life so let's put hong kong on the list too wow we've got a lot of episodes frederick that's a lot yeah <laughs> and new zealand <laughs> and no producer. New, zealand, new zealand was like one of the first countries coming up uh, you know banning foreigners to buy buy homes it was something that that the new prime minister when she came in decided to go for her. that's right and, and she's been very active recently now that she was re-elected um mm. and she was re-elected with the majority but formed a coalition anyway which is pretty interesting she's introduced a capital gains tax uh and um maybe some of my team can remember some of the other things that she recently introduced a little known fact we have a kind of shift chapter in New Zealand. It's not really a chapter, but uh, we have some uh, folks, a guy named uh, Brennan, um, who is running a shift project for five years. I think he's in year two now uh, in Auckland, and but it's, an, it's national. And he's really trying to bring the right to housing to New Zealand. Um, so while Jacinda, the prime minister is doing really great things, it's not always from a human rights place. And so he's really working hard also with the National Human Rights Commission there to get the government to recognize housing as a human right in legislation. Um, I don't know, Sam or Julieta, you could weigh in. Maybe you know a little bit more about what's happening there. I actually don't. I've been too bogged down with zone. <laughs> but what did the, the National Human Rights Commission wrote? Um, right to housing guidelines or something like that, right? A framework for the, yeah. They've done a set of guidelines on which they've put out for consultation at the moment. I'm not, I don't think it's gone further than that so far, which is setting up a, a kind of setting up the parameters for the enjoyment of the right to housing within New Zealand. It's, it's a really interesting document. It's really interesting that a, an organization at that level has done it. And hopefully mm -hmm. it's going to, they're very influential. The, the New Zealand Human Rights Commission is incredibly influential in the country. So, so, so you, you the legal people, I mean, for you, these frameworks are really important. Um, and you want as many governments as possible to, to bring them on. So can you just give for somebody, because sometimes this podcast becomes extremely nerdy, <laughs> but can you explain this for somebody who just entered into to Clubhouse right now and say, why, why do we need these human rights framework mm -hmm. in our, around our homes? Well, you know, I think a simple way of thinking about it is why should governments do better and do more when we see homelessness, people being evicted, people unable to afford the rent, and we say, oh, this is terrible. 
why do we think it's terrible? And the reason we think it's terrible is because it jeopardizes dignity, one's dignity. You can't live in dignity if you live in homelessness. You don't have security if you're fearing you're going to be evicted or if you fear that you won't be able to pay your rent and then you'll have to leave where you're living. Um, and those are core human rights values, dignity, security, human well-being. And so that's like the first thing. These are human rights issues, so we might as well treat them as human rights issues. But then also, you know, if we want our governments to do better and to do more, we need to be able to hold them to something, to get them to do that. I don't think it's good enough to say, oh, come on, be nice. You should be nice or you should play fair. It's much better if you have a way to hold them accountable. And governments around the world have signed international law that's that where they commit themselves to this stuff. I mean, they commit themselves to a social contract. And so the, the human rights framework allows us to hold them accountable to what they said they would do. I like that. I like that. So it's good. I mean, it's like, uh, because we talk a lot about like greenwashing and so on. So if people are trying to portray themselves as something they are not, we can always come after them. And that's why the frameworks are good, because you can then also now criticize people. But uh, I just saw here, we have one of our patrons uh, coming into ah. the clubhouse. And I see Mark Schloss. If you can, if you can, that I think you should just push something and wave and then we can let you in i would like to hear your voice because we've only met over the internet is that yeah possible, hi mark? mark i see you all the time on twitter but i've never met you i don't think hello yes. hello <laughs> hello hi mark how are hi, you doing Lavani. hi frederick hey where 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 are you based are you in toronto i uh i'm a resident of toronto but uh during this pandemic i I'm in Miami. I was uh, shooting a documentary, and uh, I'm still quarantined here in Miami. Uh, so um, I really love you guys. I love what you're doing. Uh, I don't always agree with everything you do. That's but I think that, good. I think that makes it more <laughs> interesting. I don't agree with myself. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. what you were just discussing um, about... Well, you know, like push is persist until something happens and uh, make the shift is um, that housing is a human right. And I love that in the abstract, but uh, I love the work of Masakuto. I'm just reading her new book, The Mission Economy, yeah. how she's advising the uh, European Council. And last week's podcast was very relevant to that. And she gets into her, her book a detailed framework how to get to the goals that we want in the concrete rather than in the abstract. So I have to just say Mark is mentioning uh, an Italian-American economist who is like one of the leading, very interesting economists right now. She has written a book called The Entrepreneurial State, uh, where she basically explains that most of the major technical breakthroughs, like the iPhone or so on, are basically a lot, most of the is developed by, by government money. And then the privates are running away with the profits and they don't pay taxes. And now she has a new book out. That's, I think that's the one you were referring, Mark, isn't it? Yeah, so she uses the, um, the experience of the uh, Apollo program in US, how you can get uh, all the stakeholders together, but you have to have a clear mission, which is like landing on the moon. And sometimes it feels getting to housing as a human right is like landing on the moon. You know, it's yeah. that hard. But in her book, she starts um, she starts with the United Nations uh, DP goals from 2015. Of course, Lalani would be very familiar with that. That set ultimately 2030 as a goal. She said 193 countries signed onto that, and one of the small pieces of that framework is housing, and it goes into a lot of specifics. And she uses that as her mission, you know, and she says that's the mission. We have a clear mission, we have a clear target date, so how do we get to that? And that's what her book is about, showing how we've done it in the past uh, with the Apollo mission how she's been working in that area in UK and she's been advising the European Council. And I think that's a great 
framework because it's uh, proven, it's scalable, and it demonstrates globally, you know, it's like a proof of concept. Europe is a proof of concept of, of her ideas. We should look into to Mariana Matsukatsi. And I, I, that's, so if anybody of our listeners know how to get hold of her, uh, because she is very, very booked. As you see, she advises governments around the world. So, but it w- would be really cool. I can also see here uh, that we have Livia Poncio uh, on. She's one of the girls, uh, one of our supporters on Twitter, at least. Livia, can you talk to us, Livia? Hi, I, I, Frederick. So nice. I just, like, jumped in. Yeah, with phone calls. Nice to talk to you and Leilani. Hi, Livia. So nice to hear your voice. Thanks, and the rest of the panel. So, yes, I can try to get you in touch, but as you said, Mariana Matsukato, she's really, really busy, but I have a, a almost direct line to her through another friend of mine who works at Harvard, she's teaching at Harvard, who also, who's also someone that would be interesting for you to talk to. She's called Rafaela Sadun. She's a professor at Harvard uh, University, so I can get you in touch with you guys. Wonderful. That's good. Where, where are you based, Livia? Yeah, at the moment, for the pandemic, I moved back from Amsterdam to, um, to the south of Italy. So I'm like... Um, and you know, and hope, hopefully, waiting for the vaccine. And and mm. and as a strategic minor for, uh, I do development in documentary filmmaking, and um, it's not the best time. Not really, Livia. <laughs> It's, but I I like your. I mean, b- both you and Mark picked kind of good quarantine uh, uh, locations, Miami and south of Italy. It's, uh, it, I mean, I, I've, I've been talking to Le- Leilani every day almost, and it's been darkness and ice storms. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I think we are always, we're always good. This was like a very special edition of Pushback Talks with some new ideas. And I think it's nice to, I'm really cool to, to hear you all. So it's a way of connecting. And I, I, Maya here, I mean, my team is, they're all busy, so they, they can't join because then we will speak into each other. But they send their love, Maya, Mikey, and Valerie, and Hannah, who is here. Um, my producer, Margaret, and, and Hannah Markinen, they are, they are at home working because of this freaking pandemic. Um, mm. But people don't see pushback talks. It's you and me, mm. and we're on the face of it. But people don't see all the back work, the the people behind it, and it's Frederick's amazing team from Mikey, who does all the sound and editing and gets all of our guests set up properly, to uh, Maya and Valerie and Hannah, who do comms and you know these cool graphics that you see. Let let me tell you, Frederick and I are not generating those. And then, of course, on my side, Kirsten is now part of this incredible WG Film team. So, uh, a big shout out and thanks to all the folks at WG who are doing this uh, for love, not money. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and that's a bit problematic. Livia, you know, as a filmmaker also, and Mark also a filmmaker, is like it's. Uh, it's not the time of money making. Well, it was never anyway, so <laughs> so it's fine. So, uh, but we could remind about uh, being uh, a Patreon. We could. We need more Patreons, and you can donate just a few dollars, just enough for Frederick to have that cortado that he so dearly loves every day. Um, we have a Patreon account. You can access it wherever you access our podcast, Pushback Talks. So, and now we will, this show will end with music of the amazing Florencia de Concilio, who is the composer mm. for the music to push. And, and she's based in Paris. Um, so, goodbye. And thank you, all of you, for being a part of this special edition of Pushback Talks. Leilani, we have to decide soon on what we're going to talk about next week. We do. (laughs) Bye, Frederick. (laughs) Bye. Thanks, everyone. (laughs) Thank you. Bye.
Pushback Talks is produced by WG Film. To watch Push, visit pushthefilm.com. You can also support us by becoming a Patreon at patreon.com slash pushbacktalks. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you again next week.